Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing, as well as analysing, tech news which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. I hope you're all having an amazing day. We certainly have lots to talk about in this video, including yet further updates to the specifications of the PlayStation 5, and some confirmations regarding the third-generation Threadripper processors from AMD. I'm not on camera for this video because I was running hideously late with client work and then on top of that as well I'm finishing a rather large analysis project regarding AMD's uh, RDNA based GPUs including the next generation so for today it won't be camera but normal service shall resume tomorrow. Anyway let's start things out with Sony and the PS5. So yesterday there was, of course, a lot of waves made when Mark Cerny provided confirmation that the PlayStation 5 would have hardware ray tracing support. They also provided other information as well, such as the name of the console being, uh, well, the PlayStation 5 and the fact that it would launch in the holiday season of 2020. There were a few other tidbits as well including 4K Blu-ray support and a game disc could be up to 100 gigabytes, and a bit more information regarding the SSD. However, there has been an interesting uh, tidbit that was actually confirmed on Sony's official website that, rather interestingly, Mark Cerny didn't actually say in the interview. The game console specifications, once again on the Japanese website, and this was spotted by... Uh, the website Famitsu, that, well, we have confirmation that there is SMT on the uh, Zen 2-based CPU. So that is 8-core, 16 threads, which means that the CPU, at least in terms of core slash thread count, is very similar to, let's say, a 3700X, um, which is actually pretty impressive. Of course, clock frequencies aren't yet known. We think that it has up to 3200 MHz for the highest end speed based upon a leaked APU, but that is certainly not confirmed by Sony. And we also don't know any specific tweaks to the Zen 2 architecture, which is implemented for the consoles. For the GPU, they've simply said AMD Radeon RDNA Radeon DNA-based graphics engine. We've heard from both AMD as well as Sony that there are customizations for the GPU, and obviously the fact that we have heard that it has hardware ray tracing in, at the very least, hints that it has second generation RDNA um, components, but we don't know specification details as yet. But another thing that Sony themselves were discussing was backwards compatibility for the PS5. Once again, Famitsu come into play here because a statement was issued to them. I'm going to read this out verbatim. We will do our best to ensure that the development team can ensure complete compatibility now. We are verifying. Please wait for further information. End quote. And this is in regards to complete backwards compatibility with other consoles other than just the PS4, so PS3, PS2, PS1, and so on. Now, to be honest with you, PS1 is going to be, well, super duper easy to run an emulator on. Uh, after all, there's a reason that Pentium 2 class PCs back in, like, you know, the 90s could run PlayStation 1 games. PS2 is a bit more taxing, but you could still run a software-based emulator on that pretty easily, the PS3 is a bit of a different kettle of fish. And the fact that it does have the sole processor could make it a little more difficult. The PlayStation 3 architecture was known to be complicated, particularly at launch. The primary difficulties with the PS3 were, one, the segmented memory uh, of the PS3. So you had 256 megabytes for the GPU, uh, which was based on an NVIDIA architecture. And then you had another 256 megabytes of main system memory for the cell processor. And the cell processor also was kind of difficult. So the cell processor actually had two different types of processor inside of it. The first was the power processing element, 
uh, power processor element, excuse me. And it was based on the power PC architecture and had a SMT capable core with a 23 stage pipeline. It ran at 3.2 gigahertz and was pretty impressive. It was quite powerful. The CPU inside the Xbox 360 was actually quite similar to that, but rather than a single core, Microsoft opted to have three of these, meaning that uh, the Xbox 360 technically had six threads running, whereas the cell processor had a single one of these cores, but it was also accompanied by several SPEs, or synergistic processing elements. And these were quite different in that they didn't have branch prediction, so we didn't really know necessarily the way that code was going to branch as it was kind of running through things. But they were very good at being able to uh, operate certain mathematically intensive calculations. The SPEs were actually quite flexible and could do everything from physics to even help processing graphics and audio and lots of other bits and bobs. It was powerful, but also quite complicated, although, of course, we saw it used really well with games like, let's say, Uncharted and The Last of Us. With this said, it has been emulated fairly well on the PC, and there are uh, PC emulators out there which have done a fantastic job in mimicking the PS3's hardware. Now, I do feel that Sony would benefit rather heavily from this, from the perspective of the customer, don't forget that, that uh, Microsoft have uh, committed to having all of the previous generation Xboxes uh, playable on the Xbox Scarlet, whatever that ends up being called. So this means the original Xbox, the Xbox 360, and of course the Xbox One. If you're cynical, you could say that this statement from Sony is in an effort to push, let's say, PlayStation Now, Although what we do know is that the PlayStation 5 will be backwards compatible with PS4 games. We've seen patents to this effect as well. And now moving on to AMD and a company doing an oopsie which is confirmed an AMD product. This time it's MSI that have done the oopsie thanks to a promotional page. This has been rather swiftly amended. Although videocards.com managed to grab a screenshot of it. So, eligible MSI products for this program, this is a promotional page, which essentially if you've purchased one of these products, you're eligible for a $25 Steam card, but only for customers who have done a review. Um, but on this promotional page, and you know, ignoring that spiel, you'll notice that there are a plethora of different motherboards. Uh, the first line has B450s and whatever, but uh, you can also see the Creator TRX40. And this, of course, is the new HEDT platform for the AMD Ryzen Threadripper 3000 series, aka Sharktooth, to its friends. If you've missed the news so far, the uh, third generation Threadripper processors will launch next month, so that's November, alongside the Ryzen 9 3950X. From what we gather from leaks, we will see the platform be a little different to the current platform and it potentially will not be uh, socket compatible so you will probably need a new motherboard for the third generation Fred Ripper processors and according to an image that AMD have been plastering over social media they say the third generation and then in much smaller writing premiering with 24 cores there's two ways you can take that. The first is that we will see 24-core parts launch first, and then at some other date we will see the 32-core parts, or they're simply saying that the minimum core count is going to be 24 for the third generation, and it will also come out with higher SKUs. We have actually seen several leaks of a 32-core part, so we know at the very least these do exist in engineering sample form, but for all we know, they could launch at a later date, let's say, for sake of argument, January or February. In the final piece of news for today, we have the official launch of the Ryzen 9 3900 and the Ryzen 5 3500 series. 
So in the case of the Ryzen 9 3900, there's not much to say here in terms of the specifications other than the TDP and the clock frequency have taken a hit. So the 3900 has the TDP of just 65 uh, watts, but the base frequency is just 3.1 gigahertz and the boost frequency is 4.3 gigahertz. Obviously, we don't know how well it overclocks yet, and we don't know uh, what the average boost speeds are or anything like that. But it's going to be pretty. It's going to be pretty popular, I suspect. Uh, this will be designed primarily um, for the pre-built market for OEM and system integrators. It's a bit of a shame that it's only going to be through OEMs. But the real head scratcher for me was the Ryzen 5 3500X. So in case you have missed news concerning this, it's still a 6-core processor and carries the same amount of cache as other Ryzen 5 CPUs, such as the 3600. And we even have a base frequency of 3.6 GHz and boosts up to 4.1 GHz. So you may say to yourself, well, gee, what the heck's the difference between the 3500X and the 3600? Well, that is SMT. Basically, SMT is disabled here, so it is only six threads. We've actually got hardware performance in just a moment, and the website has actually benchmarked it, so we'll go into a couple of results. Unfortunately, AMD are making this processor only available in China. So, unless you are in the Chinese kind of sales market, or you decide to import it, which obviously will probably eat up any of the savings you would have had over, let's say, a 3600, this CPU is not going to be available to you, which is definitely a real shame. I will link the website that has the uh, review, which is expreview.com, and I'd suggest you go ahead and check them out if you are interested in purchasing this particular CPU, as they have a myriad of different results. But how well does it perform? Well, pretty decently, but with the obvious caveat of highly multi-threaded applications not doing as well. This CPU is slightly faster to slightly slower, depending on the uh, particular uh, application, than the 9400F, but generally does outperform the 9400F, but loses to the 3600. So 7-zip, for example, uh, the 3600 scores 45,515, the 3500X scores 36,225, which is still pretty decent, but obviously not quite as good. An X265 HD benchmark, uh, you score 30 FPS with the 3600, the 3500X, uh, scores uh, 24 frames a second, and yes, I'm not going to care about the 0 0.1. Fire Strike, um, with the 3600, it scores 20,198 compared to 13,000, and, well, I think you kind of get the point, like, GTA 5 is essentially identical to the 3600, 154 frames a second for the 3500, X, where the 3600 scores 151, which is definitely margin of error kind of thing. So once again, the 3500 is definitely a really nice processor, given the fact that it's going to cost around the equivalent of 150 US dollars, but unfortunately, it's just not available outside of China. So in the final piece of news that I'd like to discuss today, KB Lake G is end of life. If you don't remember what KB Lake G is, it was a very unlikely partnership between Intel and AMD. Basically, the CPU was an 8th generation Intel processor, whereas the GPU was an Radeon RX Vega M GPU, and it was a GPU that was accompanied with 4 gigabytes of HBM2. So it was definitely one of those things that had been rumoured for some time, but when we even finally saw it announced by the companies, it was kind of like, oh, okay, it really is happening then, huh? This was actually a really good partnership for both Intel at the time, who didn't have a really good graphics solution, and AMD just to get additional revenue in. 
While the GPU wasn't as powerful as high-end NVIDIA GPUs at the time for mobile, it was still pretty nice in that you could create a thinner and smaller device. It had a smaller footprint, so did, at least in theory, put pressure on NVIDIA. Unfortunately, there wasn't as much adoption with this particular series of chips as perhaps either Intel or AMD expected. There were some companies who were quite happy to embrace it. I think Dell and HP had products which did use it, um, but it certainly wasn't as adopted as perhaps we expected. And now, obviously, it's kind of pointless because not only is the architecture, uh, the Kaby Lake architecture, kind of old now, but furthermore, Intel have solutions and are coming up with solutions which are uh, going to be kind of relying on their own hardware. So we have Generation 11 graphics right now and Generation 12, aka XE, launches next year. So this was one of those products which I think people will look back on in like five or ten years time and kind of just be scratching their head and be like, hey, I forgot that those guys did that. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you did, then the normal stuff. Like, share, comment and subscribe. And I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.